Greetings. I am Maria Padilla, Professor of Medicine and Director of the ILD program at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. It is my distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this session of the PFF Summit 2021. This session is titled Research Updates in COVID-19 and more. We will hear about what we are learning, what we are doing, and what we did about this catastrophe that has befallen us and has impacted so adversely our ILD community in so many ways. I am joined today by my distinguished colleagues who are recognized authorities in the ILD field and who have furthered it by their research, clinical care, and educational efforts. Dr. Robert Kanner is Associate Professor of Clinical and Genetic Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. He is also the director of the Weill Cornell PFF Care Center Network. Dr. Amy Hajari Case is the director of the Advanced Lung Disease Program at Piedmont Healthcare and Senior Medical Advisor for Education and Awareness for the PFF. Dr. Case is from Atlanta, Georgia. And Dr. Lisa H. Lancaster, who is Professor of Medicine, Director of the ILD uh, Program at the Vanderbilt Lung Institute, Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. They are all experts in the field and I know we are in for a special and most educational session. We thank you for your attendance and participation. And now let's get started with our presentations. Good afternoon, my name is Rob Keener. I'm from Wild Cornell Medicine in New York. And I'm going to speak to you today about what we're learning from COVID-19 and how it relates to PF. These are my disclosures. The educational objectives for this talk, um, there are a number of questions that I would like to try to address. The first question is, is COVID-19 a greater risk to those individuals with pre-existing interstitial lung disease? Is there increased infectivity? Is there increased mortality? Is there acceleration of pre-existing interstitial lung disease? The second question is, does COVID-19 cause interstitial lung disease? So what are the radiographic patterns of lung abnormalities found following COVID-19 infection? What is the pathology? What is the cellular and molecular biology um, that would favor the development of interstitial lung disease? And if there is interstitial lung disease, how frequent is it? What are the risk factors? And is pulmonary fibrosis following COVID-19 progressive? The third question is, what is the optimal treatment of post-COVID-19 interstitial lung disease? And um, we'll look at data supporting the use of steroids and uh, whether antifibrotic medication should be employed. Um, the last question, do COVID vaccines cause interstitial lung disease, is not really addressable at the time this lecture was recorded, but there may be new data um, by the time of the PFF meeting in November. So is COVID-19 a greater risk to those individuals with pre-existing interstitial lung disease? The first question, is there increased infectivity? Um, a nested case control study was performed in Korea on a nationwide cohort of patients with COVID-19, uh, over 8,000 individuals, and an age, sex, and residence match control cohort of 120,000 individuals um, between January and May of 2020. The proportion of patients with ILD was higher in the COVID-19 cohort than in the match cohort. 0.8 versus 0.4% with a highly significant p-value. ILD was significantly higher in the COVID-19 cohort than in the match cohort, 
with an adjusted odds ratio of two and a significant 95% confidence interval. Patients with ILD were more likely to have severe COVID-19 than patients without ILD, 49% versus 13%, including increased mortality of 13% versus 3%, all with a significant p-value. The risk of severe COVID-19 was significantly higher in patients with ILD than in those without ILD with an adjusted odds ratio of 2.3. And this study was published um, this year in the European Respiratory Journal. Other studies of increased mortality in COVID-19 infection in individuals with pre-existing ILD. There was a nested case control study uh, performed at the Mass General Brigham System between March and June of 2020. Over 300 patients with ILD were tested for COVID-19. 15% were positive. Of the 3,000 COVID-19 positive patients without ILD, um, 92 were selected as controls so that the subjects were matched for age, sex, and race. 15 or 33% of the 46 COVID-19 positive patients with ILD died compared with 12 or 13% of the 92 control subjects without ILD. The increased odds ratio of death uh, in patients with ILD was 3.2 with a highly significant p-value. The increased mortality was observed even after adjustment for age, sex, race, smoking status, cardiovascular disease, in any chronic immunosuppression with an odds ratio of 4.3. And this study was published last December in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. Does COVID-19 <clears throat> accelerate pre-existing interstitial lung disease? There was a case report um, of a 58-year-old male smoker who had combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema at baseline who was admitted with COVID-19 acute respiratory failure requiring treatment with 10 liters of oxygen by nasal cannula. He had repeated admissions um, over the course of the um, next several months and was treated with systemic steroids. Here are some characteristic um, images um, from that report. In the um, top row, are um, CT images from uh, September and October. And you can see that um, there is progressive development of um, worsening emphysema and ground glass opacities. Uh, the chest X-ray series on the bottom um, shows progressive um, worsening of uh, emphysematous blebs and air spaces um, with cyst formation. Um, during um, October and November uh, and worsening of the fibrotic changes. So uh, this is an example of um, worsening of lung disease in someone with uh, pre-existing combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema. A separate question is, does COVID-19 cause interstitial lung disease? Well, uh, there's a very common radiographic pattern in individuals who have uh, significant lung involvement with COVID-19. The most frequent findings are ground glass opacities, and uh, the distribution is often bilateral, multilobar, peripheral, and basilar. And the white arrows in this CAT scan image point to areas of ground glass um, opacities. Consolidation and interlobular septal thickening um, may be present in more advanced cases, and the black arrows point to areas of consolidation. So um, the constellation of ground glass opacities and consolidation with interlobular septal thickening is a typical finding, um, and the involvement is often patchy throughout both lungs. Um, and this uh, Character, this radiographic characteristic has become so commonly associated with COVID-19 that our radiologists can often guess the diagnosis without even knowing about the um, PCR results. Uh, this was published in Radiology last year. 
There's also um, some signs um, that appear to be fairly unique. Um, so this bullseye sign was uh, described by radiologists at our institution, um, along with uh, individuals at other institutions, which they've termed um, the reverse halo sign or the bullseye sign, uh, which is a variant of the reverse halo sign. And you see the, the white arrows are pointing to um, an area of ground glass surrounded by lucency, and then an area, another area of ground glass or consolidation around it. Uh, and this seems to be um, fairly characteristic of COVID-19 pneumonia. And um, evidence for COVID-19 causing interstitial lung disease um, has been strengthened by autopsy studies. So uh, in the upper panel, individuals who died of COVID-19 uh, acute respiratory failure, particularly if they died more than 30 days following the infection and had autopsies, um, had an elevated fibrosis score, um, as shown with the red dots, um, compared to individuals who died from other types of pneumonia, um, ARDS, or uh, influenza, or had no uh, respiratory illnesses. Um, so this is autopsy data supporting the development of pulmonary fibrosis um, associated with COVID-19 ARDS. In the bottom panel is the result of a single, um, single uh, nucleus RNA sequence analysis from autopsy lung. And here, um, the fibrosis score um, increased uh, as a function of the days from the symptom onset to death. And comparing COVID-19 to controls, um, there was a marked increase in um, fibroblast subsets, particularly the pathological um, fibroblasts that are associated with pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and if you look at the um, far right-hand panel C, um, the pathological fibroblasts had a highly significant increase um, in comparison with uh, controls. Uh, so this is further data supporting the, um, the biology of the possibility of pulmonary fibrosis following COVID-19 infection. There are many other features that seem to favor the development of fibrosis. Um, and this article that was in press at the time this lecture was recorded um, by Mikulski um, from David Schwartz's group, um, went through the various features that support the idea that COVID-19 could cause interstitial lung disease. So pulmonary fibrosis followed ARDS through, due to the related viruses, SARS and MERS, um, as well as influenza A. And the frequency of ARDS associated with COVID-19 seems to be similar to these viruses. Some of the pathophysiologic features that COVID-19 respiratory failure shares with uh, pulmonary fibrosis is that there is epithelial injury, there's endothelial injury, there's fibroproliferation, there's evidence of cellular senescence, there's mechanical injury um, in individuals who are supported with mechanical ventilation, and the extracellular matrix biology uh, overlaps that of pulmonary fibrosis, and particularly the uh, integrin alpha V beta 6, which is involved in the activation of transforming growth factor beta. Interestingly, um, there are uh, overlap um, of the genetic polymorphism with, IBF, with IPF and risk of severe COVID-19, although those types of studies are only uh, beginning to get underway. And just the general concept that um, viruses can activate the immune system um, supports the idea that they could potentially um, cause pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so does, uh, if COVID-19 causes interstitial lung disease, what is the frequency? What are the risk factors for development of interstitial lung disease? And is the interstitial lung disease um, progressive? Here's um, two studies, one from Austria in the top panel showing the majority of individuals at 100 days following COVID infection had CT abnormalities. And then a retrospective 
a study from China uh, in early 2020 reported a 45% incidence of ground glass opacities at six months follow-up uh, in individuals with COVID-19 infection who required supplemental oxygen during the acute illness. Um, as you can see though, the frequency does drop significantly from the acute phase to 30 days um, to 60 days post-infection. And to try to get um, <clears throat> uh, a better handle on the frequency and the uh, progressive nature of the interstitial lung disease, we at Cornell um, have entered into um, a partnership with NYU, Washington University in St. Louis, and Baylor in Houston, um, along with our colleagues at Beringer Ingelheim, who um, provided scientific collaboration and financial resources for a prospective observational study where we will investigate the 48-week prognosis of patients with COVID-19 hypoxemic respiratory failure with a specific interest in identifying markers of persistent and or progressive pulmonary fibrosis. Um, 300 participants will be enrolled. The primary endpoint is the change from baseline in fibrotic and non-fibrotic interstitial opacities on high-resolution chest CT over 48 weeks, which will be categorized as improved, stable, or worsened. And the secondary endpoints will include changes in pulmonary function, six-minute walk distance, hand grip strength, and patient-reported outcomes at each visit. There'll be blood draw at each visit for exploratory assessment of circulating biomarkers that may be associated with an increased risk of progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And the visit schedule is um, illustrated here. But what is the optimal treatment of post-COVID-19 interstitial lung disease? In terms of the use of steroids, there are now the standard of care for acute respiratory failure, along with the antiviral drug remdesivir. Um, in an observational study of over 800 individuals um, um, who had steroid treatment, and only those patients with findings of organizing pneumonia and restrictive physiology in the absence of improving symptoms were offered steroid therapy. Um, if they had organizing pneumonia changes in CT, but had less than 15% lung involvement and or no restrictive abnormality, they were not offered steroids. Similarly, patients who were not hospitalized uh, were not included in the study. And um, in those 5% with persistent ground glass opacities in six weeks who remained symptomatic, uh, the majority reported improvement with steroids. What about the use of antifibrotic drugs? So <clears throat> this was proposed um, by several investigators based on the results of the in-build progressive um, fibrotic ILD study and the expected development of fibroproliferative ARDS and COVID-19 acute respiratory failure, as I discussed previously. Um, is there a role in individuals with ground glass consolidation um, without um, progressive fibrotic ILD? Um, and the answers to those questions are really unknown. Um, there are a number of clinical trials of antifibrotic therapies for COVID-19 interstitial lung disease in progress, um, and these are listed here. They include um, BIO-300, uh, an oral suspension of genistine, uh, nintenanib, um, serolimus, um, a uh, harvested adipose tissue-derived stromal vascular fraction, um, so cellular therapy, and duprofenadone. Um, and these are um, ongoing trials in the United States that were listed on clinicaltrials.gov um, at the time this lecture was recorded in September. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have about COVID-19 and pulmonary fibrosis. Hi, I'm Amy Hajari Case from Piedmont Healthcare in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'll be giving an update on COVID-19 vaccines or how to make your own polyclonal antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 without first getting infected. Um, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures on this topic, but I should disclose that I've been fully vaccinated against uh, SARS-CoV-2 and I have had my booster shot. <laughs> 
So I wanna talk a little bit about the layers of protection we have against COVID-19. Vaccines are a really important, really strong layer of protection, but no single intervention is perfect at preventing the spread or of disease. And so this Swiss cheese model is a good, um, good metaphor for how we, uh, how we think of these layers of protection. Early in the pandemic, when we didn't have vaccines, we would use things like mask wearing and social distancing to try to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Now that we have vaccines, that's just another additional layer of protection that we have against, uh, against spread of the virus. But again, none of these layers is totally perfect. And we might choose different layers like face coverings and mask wearing um, or others, depending on the activity in question or the individual's own risk budget and how important the activity in question might be. So specific to vaccines, there are lots of different types of vaccines in development and used in different parts of the world against SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, in the United States, we have mRNA vaccines and viral, a viral vector vaccine. Both of these deliver um, uh, nucleic acid uh, particles to the body that then transcribe them and are recognized as part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus so that, that then the immune system learns to recognize that and mounts an immune response should that uh, virus be encountered. So mRNA sounds like a really newfangled technology, totally 21st century, but I want you to remember or at least understand that mRNA technology has been in, developed, in development for many decades, as have the lipid nanoparticles that deliver the mRNA um, particles in the vaccine. And so these, uh, these types of delivery systems have been in uh, preclinical trials for many, many decades, and in clinical trials in humans for different reasons for quite a long time. And really, it just came to be that the COVID-19 pandemic is a great opportunity to utilize this technology in a way that helped deliver these vaccines in a highly effective way. Now, this is a, a, a little graphic from the New York Times uh, that was published last summer as a way to try to understand the accelerated vaccine development timeline that we were seeing before it actually came to fruition at the end of last year um, and how we were working towards the, the development of those vaccines much faster than the traditional timeline. You can see here, this is a really typical timeline for the development of the historically for vaccines um, where all the steps happen sequentially and not concurrently. And sometimes even there's big gaps between the different steps. What happened in the pandemic, however, is we saw a real shortening of this timeline where some of all of the steps were still taken. And that's an important point to make here that no skip steps were skipped. They all happened, but some of them happened before the previous step was totally finished. And that's a bit of a gamble on the part of vaccine developers and people funding those vaccines. Because if something didn't work out in phase, phase one, but they'd gone ahead with phase two and phase three studies, well, it's possible that all of that effort might be for naught. But that's not how it turned out for the vaccines that we currently have. We really developed those on an accelerated timeline. And that had to do with the funding, with the pouring in of effort, with collaboration, and with the volunteers, the people who uh, were part of these studies, were subjects in the phase one, two, and three studies that led to the results that we have. And then on the manufacturing side, getting those pieces of infra infrastructure in place early on, again, a gamble, but it paid off in the end where we were able to have in less than a year effective vaccines to be delivered to people. Now, big question, do the vaccines work? And I'm gonna show you this data from um, on the left, the Pfizer uh, landmark study and the Moderna phase three study. Um, what you see here, I'll give you some pointers. Uh, the top lines in both of these were placebo recipients and those who developed symptomatic COVID-19, not just test positive, but symptomatic COVID-19 with, with, uh, with placebo and those uh, recipients that got the actual vaccines that developed symptomatic COVID-19, so far fewer. So if this is a little too complicated, I'm gonna show you this good statistics tip. You should always try to get data that's good enough that you don't need to do statistics on it, right? So uh, COVID cases were significantly reduced in the vaccine group 
uh, relative to the placebo group. Now, this was early on in the pandemic. Remember, these were tested. The phase three studies were done in 2020. This predated um, some of the variant issues that we're dealing with. But this is from the CDC's MMWR, showing that in the real world, after Delta became the most common variant circulating in the United States, fully vaccinated people had a very significantly reduced risk of infection, hospitalization, and death, even with the Delta variant. So uh, even after these phase three studies, in real world uh, people, vaccination offers very strong protection against COVID-19. Now the timeline, we'll go back to what actually happened. Um, it, back in, uh, so the pandemic started, in uh, early 2020, we had er emergency use authorizations based on the strength of the data for Pfizer, then the Moderna mRNA vaccines, and then an emergency use authorization for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a viral vector vaccine, similar strong data for that uh, single dose regimen there. Um, and all of those have been available um, in the United States under emergency use authorization. Uh, the Pfizer, uh, um, vaccine is available for uh, people down to age 12. And then in August of 2021, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, the uh, EUA for the mRNA vaccines was amended to include a third dose for those individuals who are immunocompromised. And then amazingly enough, you know, less than two years after the onset of this pandemic, we have a fully approved by the FDA vaccine against um, COVID-19 in August of 2021. And this is an ongoing timeline. So we've got an arrowhead on the, on the right there. So let's talk about why all this vaccine business is important, right? It, it uh, protects the individual. And we talked about that, right? The efficacy in those individuals against symptomatic COVID-19, but it also protects others. So when you have nobody vaccinated, the virus spreads just unchecked. And when you have some people vaccinated, that slows down spread a little bit because fewer people can, can get it and then spread it. When everybody's vaccinated, I'll let this run through one more time, when many people are vaccinated, the virus just doesn't have anywhere to go. It has no one to skip to. And so it can't get to those more distant people who may be unvaccinated or ineligible for vaccination, or maybe they got vaccinated, but they're less protected because of their immune status. It, it, protects other people as well as the individuals that are vaccinated. And this is nicely demonstrated in, uh, in this graphic, again, from the New York Times. This is showing on the left the 10 most vaccinated states in the United States, so concentrated mostly in the Northeast. But these are hospital admissions, so significant illness from COVID-19 per 100,000 people. And it's showing an increase, you know, as the Delta variant started circulating in adult, the adult population. Certainly went up, but these are areas that are the most vaccinated in the country. And we really didn't see a blip in the under 18 crowd that was that largely unvaccinated because the vast majority of them are ineligible for vaccination. And so the adults being, uh, being largely vaccinated is showing some protection for those kids who can't be vaccinated. Now in the 10 least vaccinated states, so concentrated down here in the Southeast where I am, we've had a really significant increase in hospital admissions for adults, but, but tracking with that, we've had a significant increase in the adolescent and child population that's been hospitalized for COVID-19. Again, a population that can't be vaccinated, but not really being protected by low vaccination rates in the adults that can be. So let's talk about people who can be vaccinated but may have less protection. This is a, a, a a summary of lots of different studies looking at the immune response, so the, the antibody response to two doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines in different immunocompromising conditions. And so I'm going to focus a little bit on organ transplant and immunosuppressive therapies here, because this is what really affects our community the most, although certainly people may be on hemodialysis and cancer. What we see here is that the number of people 
or the number of studies with a low, uh, lower um, average antibody response in the individuals included was, uh, was a lot lower in the organ transplant population. These patients oftentimes are on multiple immunosuppressive medications and those on immunosuppressive therapies, and they may be on one or more immunosuppressive therapy um, for an underlying disease. So this is more data along those lines showing the um, showing the response to, again, the different doses of mRNA vaccines. This is in uh, organ transplant recipients. So on the left here, you see the number of people that have a measurable antibody response, uh, so zero before their first dose of, of vaccine, a few after the first dose and before the second, then you get almost up to 40% for those people um, before a third dose and after a third dose. So, so an early booster here for people who are, again, solid organ transplant immunocompromised, you get almost up to 70% with a measurable immune response. So not 100%, but a lot higher with a third dose. And the titers of those antibodies, so the level of antibody positivity goes up quite a lot after a third dose as well. And this data, among other uh, and other studies that have been uh, been published, led the FDA to authorize a third dose of mRNA vaccine in immunocompromising conditions such as solid organ transplant or those taking immunosuppressive therapies. And those types of immunosuppressive therapies are listed here at the bottom of the slide, including high dose steroids and some of the immunosuppressive medications that our community members could be on. All right, so a little bit more about safety and side effects. I want you to remember that while this has happened really fast, we now have over 200 million doses or people vaccinated against COVID-19 in the United States and 5.8 billion doses worldwide. So you're not a guinea pig. There are lots of people out there and there's lots of safety data. We're gonna look at the side effects here compared side by side. On the very left here is the Shingrix, that's the shingles vaccine. And on the very right side, the flu vaccine. So what we find is that the COVID vaccine side effect profiles are, as far as severity goes, somewhere in the middle between those two, where Shingrix is a little harder to take, flu not so bad. But what we get is some immunogenicity um, side effects, meaning sometimes fever, a little fatigue, chills, uh, aching. And certainly um, I got my COVID booster just a few days ago and my arm's still a little bit sore. So that's pretty common. Now the FD, I'm sorry, the CDC has been following closely for safety with several different mechanisms that they have um, for vaccine safety. You may have been asked to register with vSafe, which is a health checker. Um, and then the vaccine adverse event reporting system is used as an early warning for the CDC and FDA to identify problems after vaccination. And as a result of this safety following, we know about some serious vaccine complications and we also know about how, um, how often they occur. With the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there was a pause in its use early on because of the discovery of a vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia syndrome, meaning that, that there was clotting, but also low platelets that could happen in response to the vaccine, usually a week or two after vaccination, and much more common, even though very, very rare, more common in women under age 50. Now, thrombotic complications are way higher with COVID-19 infection. And so the, the assessment was that this was still an okay vaccine to be used in the general population, but we needed to be aware of this and, and doctors needed to know what to look for and how to treat it should this happen in, in the rare instance. With the mRNA vaccines, there's a, there is an incidence of myocarditis or pericarditis, meaning inflammation of the heart muscle that occurs uh, in about 13 in 1 million young people, more often in uh, men uh, or young men or boys uh, than in uh, girls or women. And again, more often in young people, This usually happens within several days of the vaccine and is often self-limited. And again, myocarditis occurs much, much more commonly in COVID-19 infection than it does with a vaccine. And so this has continued to be used, but it has been something that's been monitored. And again, does need to be something that the public and healthcare professionals are aware of. So let's talk about uh, vaccine efficacy over time. Um, so this is data from England where they use the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a viral vector vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine again, like we have here. This is looking at vaccine efficacy. So how well it works and prevents infection 
Um, in the patients who are uh, vulnerable, meaning they're older, they have medical problems, there is some drop off in the efficacy of both types of vaccine, um, a little less so in those who are not considered clinically extremely, extremely vulnerable. And this is matched by some data out of Israel, which used pretty exclusively the Pfizer vaccine, showing that th these are cases. So this is the opposite of vaccine efficacy, um, where the higher the graph goes, the more cases are happening. In the unvaccinated, you know, very high numbers. Uh, with two, two doses of vaccine, you did have some uh, waning efficacy. And then with a the booster, that really um, prevented uh, cases and severe cases. And this is some data on uh, U.S. vaccine efficacy. It's a little busy, so I'm going to blow up for you here that Moderna actually has maintained its vaccine efficacy a bit better than, uh, than the Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson vaccines over a four-month time period or longer, um, and uh, a little bit of a fall-off in terms of infections and hospitalizations for the other two, but still pretty highly protective when you're, when you're looking at across the board. So, so I'm going to answer a few frequent questions um, about vaccinations. Can getting vaccinated for COVID-19 cause me to test positive for COVID-19? The answer to that is no. Tests for active infection, like a PCR test or antigen test for which you'd be nasal swabbed, would not be positive due to vaccination. So that comes up positive, you probably have COVID. Um, but there are antibody tests, a so blood test or finger prick test that can be positive after vaccination or infection. Are there any medical reasons someone should not get a COVID-19 vaccine? And that really circles only around severe allergic and anaphylactic type reactions after a previous dose or a severe re allergic reaction to an ingredient in one of the vaccines, particularly polyethylene glycol or polysorbate. Immunosuppressed patients, patients with pulmonary fibrosis really should be vaccinated and that's not a good medical reason to not get vaccinated. Now, can the vaccine cause or worsen pulmonary fibrosis? This is really not uh, something that we're concerned about, not something that we've seen so far. This type of reaction is not seen with vaccines for other types of respiratory viruses in which the immune system is activated against something uh, something to help it recognize other respiratory viruses like the flu. And since patients with pulmonary fibrosis are considered very high risk for severe illness and complications from COVID-19, we strongly recommend that they should be vaccinated. Now, this uh, question, I have my COVID-19 vaccine. When can I go and do things? See my grandkids, go to a restaurant, travel on a plane, quit wearing my mask, so on and so forth. And I would take you back to that Swiss cheese strategy, right? The model there is that vaccines are part of your risk reduction strategy, and they're not 100% effective. They're part of a layered strategy um, of protection. And, and so we should continue to utilize those other layers when it's appropriate. We should consider any activity in context of your own risk budget, including how risky the activity is and how important it is to you. Finally, I'm going to point you to some uh, Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation COVID-19 resources. We do have a resource page on our website that we keep up to date with, um, with information as it develops and things are moving very quickly. And I will thank you and show you these last pictures of animals at, uh, the, uh, at Zoo Atlanta. The uh, gorillas unfortunately all got COVID-19, but they have recovered and all of these animals have since been vaccinated and you should too. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Lisa Lancaster from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And we're going to be discussing the COVID-19 pandemic survey from the PFF Centers of Excellence that occurred during the first surge of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've experienced a lot of change with COVID-19 since March of 2020, and these changes and challenges have really been unprecedented to providers and to patients. We've all experienced changes in social interaction with social distancing, working from home, uh, barrier uh, protection, including masks, changes to our medical care, uh, usual routines with changing uh, uh, personnel from clinics to critical care wards, clinic closures, delay in elective surgeries, and patients even delaying or making personal decisions to delay their preventative care out of fear of going to the hospital. 
So we at the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation completed this survey with our care center networks um, for these three study aims. And they included assessing the impact of the pandemic on PFF centers, identifying management strategies at PFF ILD centers during the pandemic, and also to gather this information and inform future strategies for clinical care and research to continue when other medical challenges occur. So here's an outline of our study design. It was a survey of all 68 PFF care center networks and was conducted from June 15th to June, July 13th of 2020. Ultimately, it was reviewed by the Vanderbilt IRB and felt to be exempt. Physicians, nurses, and research coordinators completed this survey. 94% or 64 out of 68 centers responded. And each center was identified, which is the uh, limitation of the study design and, and therefore not anonymous. There were 38 questions that covered a variety of topics, mainly on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their care of patients and research. The survey was completed through SurveyMonkey and distributed by the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation via email. The questions were mostly in multiple choice formats, single and multiple answer selection options. There were a few open-ended questions and a few yes-no questions. And the focus of the survey was very encompassing and, and discussed staffing, operations at the clinic, telemedicine, patient monitoring, safety measures, conduct of clinical trials, and infection with staff and ILD patients. So let's look at staffing at our clinics during the early pandemic. Well, two of the 64 centers had completely closed. Prior to the pandemic, uh, there were a median of four ILD providers at each of the centers with on average about one nurse assigned to each clinic. But all of the clinics experienced personnel challenges and those included reassignment of ILD providers and staff from the clinic to fill spots of need in the hospital and some were impacted by having their staff assigned to work from home. But as a result, there was less nursing coverage experience covered by different nurses who may not be familiar with ILD uh, patient needs. There was a decreased ability of the clinics uh, to provide clinic care due to that loss of staffing and increased physician workloads due to loss of the nursing support. There were restrictions on clinics as well, and there, were, there was not a single center that was open without any restrictions. Four centers were open to in-person visits with reduced schedules, but this was unusual. There were many centers that were actually closed during this time. So what happened with telehealth? Well, this was an interesting phenomenon that started and uh, grew exponentially with the pandemic and ultimately will be something uh, we're on, we'll continue to use likely down the road and incorporate in our care for patients. Pre-pandemic, 76% uh, of, per of the centers had no telehealth, but 97% had electronic medical records that had telehealth capabilities. Post-pandemic, 59% of centers were making telehealth appointments with rare in-person visits. And 25% of those centers had telehealth visits only. But we all experienced challenges with telehealth. And those challenges included delays in implementation by our IT departments, patient and provider inexperience with uh, telehealth services. Limitations to the number of patients that could be seen uh, in a clinic due to either combination of inpatient and telehealth visits or just telehealth alone, uh, limiting the number of patient sessions. And technologic challenges with the telehealth interface. Only 37% of centers reported having remote monitoring capabilities 
for objective data. And that's something we'll need to gradually expand on as a result of this. As pulmonologists, we're very much uh, impacted by that objective data with pulmonary function testing and oxygenation in our patients. So having that objectivity provided with the telehealth visit is going to be important down the road. So how did pulmonary function testing go? Well, half of the centers temporarily suspended pulmonary function tests. One third allowed PFTs only when deemed exceedingly necessary for their appointment. And um, for our center, mostly that included uh, strategies that changed uh, management of the patient or was required for lung transplantation. 5% opened PFTs without restriction, uh, yet there were strategies for maintaining PFT uh, safety that were adopted by centers mostly across the board that had uh, independently been uh, created. Most centers required COVID-19 pre-procedural testing prior to their PFTs to ensure negativity before uh, PFTs were done due to risk of aerosolization. There was reduced capacity. So patients were spaced further apart in their visits to allow plenty of time for vigorous cleaning in between appointments. Bronchodilator testing was generally avoided and additional filters were added to the pulmonary function testing equipment. Other diagnostic tests such as bronchoscopy and lung biopsy were also uh, severely limited. By the pandemic. How did we go about managing our patients on antifibrotic and ensure that they had their safety labs? Well, no centers elected to stop patients uh, taking their nintetinib or profenadone due to safety concerns. Antifibrotic labs uh, were continued to be done, but at varying intervals. 47% of labs uh, done for safety were done at the recommended intervals. 58% of safety labs were spaced a little further apart, prolonging the time for uh, patients to come in and get those labs done and trying to limit their exposure when surges occurred. 14% uh, allowed for missed safety labs. There were tools that were noted by the different centers and ILD providers as uh, would have been very helpful had they had them during the pandemic. And those were noted as home health services, home pulmonary rehab, and online support groups. And the interesting thing, we've seen some of these evolve as time goes by. The home health services uh, noted by providers included six minute walk testing, ambulatory oximetry, spirometry, vital signs, safety labs, and EKGs. Uh, some of these would have been very useful for clinical trials as well. Home pulmonary rehab is beginning to evolve and we're seeing some uh, companies create home pulmonary uh, rehab for patients online now. Uh, liftclass.com is one example. Online support groups um, are also evolving and becoming more popular with uh, PF Warriors being an example. What infection control measures did the centers institute? Well, similar to many other uh, clinics uh, in the US, uh, there were measures to protect patients and measures to protect uh, providers. Uh, for patients, appointments were staggered. Uh, some patients even uh, didn't wait in a waiting room. They waited in their car until their designated appointment time and then were texted or called when it was time to come in. Temperature checks were done on arrival uh, at the center along with screening questions for COVID-19 symptoms. Non-centers actually relocated to another clinic space to limit uh, the interaction of their patients with other patients who may have been presenting to the hospital because they felt like they had symptoms of COVID-19. For providers, uh, we all were uh, surgical uh, cloth mask, some were gowns, uh, hand washing was frequent, eye protection in some locations, and gloves as well were instituted. What about 
COVID-19 infection for staff, providers, and patients? And how did that impact the care center networks? Well, 12.5% of centers noted that during the early initial surge, they had providers and nursing staff that had contracted COVID-19 and were out because of that, understaffing their clinics. What about patients with the initial surge? Well, 5% or less of ILD patients at PFF care centers were initially affected during that first surge of COVID-19 or during that first initial uh, time of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And six of the centers estimated about five to 10% prevalence. And those were in regions where COVID-19 hit the hardest initially, including the Northeast, Michigan, and California. Interestingly, 19 centers in the very beginning were unaware of any positivity in their patients. And that shows you how our patients uh, utilized these measures of uh, separating themselves, uh, social distancing, wearing a mask, and really uh, protecting themselves as recommended during the initial outbreak. 84% of centers reported providing messaging to their patients on safety practices uh, and maneuvers to avoid infection, as well as the importance of maintaining regular follow-up. Access to care and economic impacts were also felt by our care center network clinics. 95% of centers experienced a drop in patient volume, and those reasons were varied. Uh, sometimes it was the clinic's own infectious risk concerns limiting access to clinic. Uh, the repurposing of providers and staff to cover inpatient duties as the hospital numbers rose of inpatients. Clinic closures occurred in some locations for up to a couple of months. There were delayed appointments with reschedules that were because the clinic was rescheduling, sometimes because patients were rescheduling because they were concerned about uh, coming into clinic and being exposed to other patients. Some visits were converted to telehealth or phone calls. There were other uh, limitations on access to care and economic at impact that included furloughs. 11 centers experienced voluntary furloughs and 19 centers experienced mandatory furloughs. And we found that staff were affected more than nurses who were affected more than physicians with these furloughs. So what was the impact on clinical research for ILD patients during this time? 75% of centers actually stopped all research activities. 94% of centers halted all new patient screening. How did individual ILD trials manage patient visits? Well, there are a lot of strategies to manage the visits and try to gain as much data as possible during this time of uh, limited access. There are modifications to study uh, protocols. One ILD study uh, that we knew of at the time was actually halted. Uh, visits were managed a little differently. 50% of centers conducted follow-up visits via telemedicine. 17% of centers uh, suspended all follow-up study visits. And 13% conducted in-person follow-up only for safety, monitoring, and distribution of drug. 9% conducted all follow-up visits in person as previously uh, outlined in the protocols. Pulmonary function testing was, was also significantly affected and most centers required pre-procedural COVID testing before the PFTs were done. But gaining coverage for this pre-procedural COVID-19 testing from sponsors was noted to be a significant challenge uh, after the fact. Other research strategies included converting study labs to local safety labs and home medication delivery. Some studies even utilized home health. So what about staffing impact during the initial surge of the COVID-19 pandemic for our search programs? 
at the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation Care Center. Well, 47% of research coordinators were limited from working on site, and 40% of centers had research coordinators working remotely from home. Two thirds of centers felt that they had lost 20% or more of data. 10 centers felt that about 50% of data at their center was lost. And at 25% of centers, no research data could be collected. That's hugely impactful uh, as we try to move forward to find therapies uh, for patients with fibrotic and inflammatory ALDs. There were some strategies that evolved and continue to evolve to collect safety and research data, and those include the utilization of home health, study nurse home visits, commercial labs, and the use of primary care practices or offices for uh, safety lab collection. Our survey did have limitations. The, the distribution of the survey was only to the PFF participating care center networks, so we did not capture the experience of other ILD providers outside the network. The responses were not anonymous. We knew the centers and the responses uh, that they came from. This was conducted only during the initial phase of the pandemic. So practices and care delivery at all of these sites have continued to evolve and will continue to evolve as we gather more data and understand better how we can care for our patients with infectious diseases. We also didn't include multidisciplinary discussions uh, for the diagnosis of patients with interstitial lung disease. So that particular element was not addressed in the survey. Even though we had a lot of challenges, we did have some positive gains from the pandemic. What were those? Well, as Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation care centers, we understood and we found out exactly how flexible and resilient we are. We've come up with many ideas and strategies to help maintain the care and move forward with research in a very difficult and challenging situation of a worldwide pandemic. And we've also evolved to utilize telehealth that we didn't uh, utilized routinely before, making uh, care more encompassing and more convenient uh, for patients. That's all of our information that I'm sharing with you for the survey. And at this point, we'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks for your attention and joining us today. As promised, this was a wonderful session. Thank you to all our speakers for a marvelous uh, uh, presentation. And thank you to our participants for your active uh, input and questions that I see in the uh, chat box and we will address momentarily. They're all wonderful. And I hope we can get to all of them um, during the period of question and answer. But before we start, Dr. Case, Amy, has an update because these uh, things, as we know from COVID, everything is evolving very quickly. And when we report something a month before, we already have to update it. So I will turn over to Amy, uh, Dr. Case, so that she can give us an update on the boosters at this point. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, thanks, Maria. You guys are getting a little bit of a peek behind the curtain here. We recorded, most of us recorded our sessions uh, several weeks ago or even longer. And um, as, as I'm sure you've realized, uh, we're watching the COVID book as it's, uh, we're reading it as, as it's being written. And so um, we've got a lot of chapters left to go, but I wanted to just take a moment uh, because there's some obvious omissions from my session um, to just give a little update. Um, and uh, when I recorded my remarks a few weeks back, the FDA had not yet taken up the question of booster shots after the initial COVID vaccine series. But since then, we've had some new developments. In current state, the FDA has authorized and the CDC has recommended for those uh, people who received an initial two-dose mRNA vaccine series, so that's Pfizer um, 
BioNTech or Moderna. Um, high risk individuals should receive a booster dose of vaccine six months after the second dose. And high risk here refers in this case to older uh, adults or those who have high risk medical problems. And those who are at high risk due to exposure, perhaps due to their job or living, living situations such as those in healthcare jobs, uh, a booster may also be given. For all adult recipients of a single dose of the viral vector vaccine that in the US is uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, regardless of age or medical history, a booster dose is now recommended two or more months after the initial shot. So all Johnson recipients are eligible for a booster. And in either case, it's acceptable to mix or match vaccine types. And that may be an individualized decision that people make with their, with their physician if there are specific questions about that. And of note here, just to clarify, the term booster is separate and different from the third shot that I talked about previously that's recommended for immunocompromised individuals. And those people who have immunocompromising conditions would be eligible for a booster, or in this case, fourth dose, uh, six months after their third shot in the case of a three-dose mRNA series. So that's my updates, and I'll, I'll uh, toss it back to Maria because I know we have a lot of um, really engaged folks with some great questions. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Amy. And uh, so looking through these wonderful questions, I'm going to try to group them and uh, direct them to uh, one, but everybody please contribute uh, to the answers to the question. So Rob, Dr. Kanner, uh, let me start with you and ask you, uh, as of today, is there any incidence of ILD or an exacerbation of existing ILD due to COVID-19 vaccines? Um, thanks, Maria. So th there is a case report that was published in Thorax in September um, of an older individual who had no pre-existing lung disease who developed um, interstitial infiltrates following a COVID-19 vaccine without any intercurrent illness. Um, he refused any invasive diagnostic um, procedures, um, but it seemed very likely that it was a vaccine-induced um, episode of um, acute interstitial lung disease, and he was treated with high-dose steroids, and he completely recovered. That's the only um, case report that's been published that I'm aware of. So. While there is this one case, and I presume that more will be reported in the future, um, it's such a rare entity that it doesn't change the relative risk to benefit ratio favoring getting the vaccine. So it shouldn't dissuade anyone from getting the vaccine, but there was a case report uh, reporting this. Do you think that it may be a case of hypersensitivity reaction to the vaccine? Um, that's very possible. I mean, we don't really have a lot more information about um, how and why. Um, so that's that's very possible. Okay. All right. Uh, let's take number four for you too, Rob. Are the lungs able to recover from the damage from COVID over time for a patient that does not have ILD? Well, um, one of the reasons one of the reasons that we um, developed the observational registry that I talked about in my lecture is um, because this is one of the questions we'd like to answer. Um, anecdotally, it seems that um, many, many patients are getting better over time um, from the lung damage that they sustained um, with acute COVID-19 infection. But we don't know what the incidence is, and we don't know what the natural history is. And that's what we're trying to determine with our registry. So um, in general, I think most patients have improved over time, but the extent of improvement um, and whether they've been able to go back to baseline or they're left with some permanent damage to their lungs is something that remains to be seen. And that's what we're trying to discover. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And Along the same uh, uh, venue there, uh, there is a question that addresses the issue of they will uh, not call it fibrosis given the rates of resolution until about nine to 12 months from the present. 
there is thought that that it is related to loss of the surfactant and mimics fibrosis without actually being uh, fibrotic. Hence, it's reversible. Is there an appropriate amount of time that we should wait to allow for the resolution of these? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. And that, that's one of the questions that we'd like to try to answer with our observational registry, because no one really knows the answer to that. I think um, that the, the observations that have been made to date are that there are, are two major patterns of lung abnormality that have been observed after COVID-19 respiratory failure. One is predominantly ground glass opacities and consolidation. Um, and those do tend to get better over time. People that remain symptomatic are often treated with steroids. And usually there's improvement. Um, the other pattern that's been observed is in people who had more severe um, uh, acute respiratory failure with um, acute um, respiratory distress syndrome. They were often on hypooxygen or were intubated. And in that um, more classic ARDS pattern, um, they can develop fibrosis um, more rapidly. Now, fortunately, it seems that that um, syndrome is less frequent than the first one that I described with ground glass and consolidation. So um, I think that it is prudent um, to wait many months before um, being certain that someone actually has pulmonary fibrosis. But as I said, that question is exactly what we'd like to try to answer with our um, observational study. And also to follow up on that, there is a question that is asking whether there is an accepted uh, working definition of what is COVID pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah, that, that, that is also a great question. And the short answer is no, there is no generally agreed upon definition. And so when we are evaluating the, um, the CT scans that we'll be um, doing during our observational registry, we're gonna be scoring separately for different radiographic features like ground glass opacities, like consolidation, and like um, reticulation and architectural distortion that are more um, closely associated with actual fibrosis. Yeah. So we, we hope to um, maybe be able to expand on those findings and to um, come up with a good answer to that question. Yes, we eagerly await those results and think. And so now I have a, a number of questions that would go for Amy. And uh, let's see, Dr. Case, why do some people lose immunity quicker than others? And uh, this particular um, and colleague is asking whether the immunocompromise uh, uh, lose their vaccine antibodies quickly and why? Yeah, so um, immunocompromised individuals are just that. Their immune systems are not fully functional as, a, as a, another person's might be. And so uh, their ability to um, generate an immune response is less um, than, uh, than their you know, other age matched and, and other medical problem matched co uh, colleagues or cohorts. Anyways, um, so... Now, the waning immunity is probably, you know, it's different depending on the person. So it's individualized, I think, in terms of response. And I know we had another question I'll just go ahead and um, address, mm -hmm. and that is um, about immunity after infection. And we've seen that there's a highly variable um, response and duration of antibodies um, after infection. And so, um, so again, a lot of this is going to be variable and depends on, on the human being. What we have are population or large group studies. Antibody responses do go down over time. That is, that's, that is natural and appropriate. Your body shouldn't generate large numbers of antibodies to, um, after vaccine, the, the spike protein um, without continuing to be stimulated to do so. So those numbers are going to go down over time. We develop, though, um, memory. Our, our immune system has a memory, and it can generate those antibodies again 
once re-stimulated to do so either by um, uh, seeing the actual virus or a booster shot or something like that. Um, and we also develop cellular immunity, meaning that not just antibodies or the proteins that, that attach to the virus itself and neutralize it. And that way, um, we develop cells that can, that can go in and kill, uh, kill virus or kill viral um, infected cells as well. And, and that's a little less well um, uh, uh, promoted in, in, when we hear about this in, in media and talks and things like that. It's a little harder to study, um, but our vaccines do generate um, cell-mediated immunity as well. Mm -hmm. Antibodies do seem to be, be uh, um, correlated with the amount of protection that we get, but I'll remind you that what I when I talked about before, the um, even with waning antibody responses and in, and increased some increased risk of infection, the protection against hospitalization and death from COVID still very good um, months out from our vaccines. Mm -hmm. That actually answers a couple of other questions that they had. So, uh, do the levels matter? And do you have a cutoff that you say to a patient, uh, you know, you are not protected? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we don't know the answer of what is a protective level of antibody. Again, because in a normal person with normal uh, immune system, a normal immune system, an antibody production is going to wane over time. So it's a function of how close you are to that exposure, how much antibody is going to be running around, but you can always generate that response uh, later. Most people will. Um, an antibody test is probably not a good idea necessarily for people with normal immune systems. Um, but in those people who have immunocompromising conditions and want to discuss that with their doctor, it might be a useful tool um, to show whether they've had some measurable um, antibody response. And we also want to make sure that if we're getting antibody tests, um, again, through a physician with a discussion about what that may mean, we want to make sure that if it's testing for um, vaccine-related immunity, we're getting a spike protein antibody, which is what's generated from a vaccine response and not a nucleocapsid antibody, which is only going to be positive after an infection with the virus itself. Okay. And there were also some recent studies that looked at uh, comparing some patients who have had low levels of um, anti humoral uh, response but had good uh, T cell response. We don't check for that T cell response in, uh, when we uh, see our patients. So that creates a, a problem. Okay. Someone wanted to know when to um, vaccinate the COVID patients who are joining the pulmonary rehab uh, program. Uh, what determines when and if they can be vaccinated? So from a timeline standpoint, um, they're really, once a person is not isolated and they're well enough, um, they can be vaccinated. Um, I have heard some misperceptions about having to wait three months. I think the, the, the conventional wisdom there is you can wait up to three months, meaning that uh, we think that most people have decent protection from the infection itself for at least that period of time. Um, that said, if uh, the patient received a monoclonal antibody infusion uh, at the time of their infection, meaning that they were given passive antibodies through an injection or infusion, you may have heard this referred to as like Regeneron or something like that because it's the name of the company that makes the, makes the therapy. If they got those monoclonal antibodies infused, they do need to wait 90 days after that to be vaccinated. So that's the, that's the, the um, longest time frame that has a hard cutoff there. Oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me, uh, there are many more questions, but I'll get back uh, to you. So, uh, Maria, may I, may, I, may I ask Amy a question about vaccines and immunocompromised? Yes. <laughs> Amy, what, what advice do you give to your patients about holding immunosuppression um, around a vaccine? That's another question in the chat. So, good. <laughs> you can go ahead and ask that. That's a really important point. So the American College of Rheumatology does have some recommendations about specific agents um, and, um, and, and when and how long to hold 
or, or to uh, dose the vaccine if it's something that's given like uh, rituximab is given every six months, uh, when to time that va vaccine based on the dose of their medication if it's not something they're doing daily. Um, that that um, assumes that the patient is stable and can do that hold or, or specific timing. So that's a, that's a conversation to have with the physician on the basis of the stability of the disease and the ability to hold and the drug in question. Now um, let's let's switch over to the transplant population. Those patients really need to have uh, a conversation again with their transplant team because it may not be advisable to hold their um, immunosuppressive medications depending on where they are in their transplant journey and what's going on with their transplant. So, so there may be some reasons to either time or hold medications just depending on the individual circumstances. And what about individuals whose interstitial lung disease is being treated with oral immunosuppressive medications and they're not a transplant? They haven't had a transplant. What do you do yeah. with those individuals? Yeah, so um, with the specific instance of uh, mycophenolate, for example, we do tend to use the ACR recommendations and hold uh, briefly um, before and after dosing. Um, with people that are steroid dependent, uh, we can try to get that dose down um, as low as can be tolerated. It really has to do with the, the individual um, patient, but I do try to hold if, if they're stable enough to do so, um, particularly uh, mycophenolate um, is a thioprint. And we do try to talk about timing um, with those on um, infusion therapies too. Okay, great. Lisa, let's um, take some questions for you, please. I'm trying to get back to those. Um, any idea how programs outside of the PFF care centers manage their ILD uh, patients during uh, the pandemic? You know, only anecdotally, we unfortunately didn't have access to be able to um, query that population and only had access to the PFF centers. This is just a PFF survey. But um, and only, uh, at least in my area and region, not too dissimilar. Uh, and then in subsequent surges, uh, and I'm sure you all experienced this too, some of your centers around were so, uh, pulmonary practice is so inundated in patients that some pulmonary practices even had to short term close their outpatient programs and uh, focus their personnel on inpatient care. So I, I think it really varied according to the, to the surge in the region and uh, uh, varied based on resources in the community if you're, or if you're rural, the population of patients you were serving. I, I agree with you. It depends on how bad it was because we closed down for about three months completely and it was telemedicine ramped up to the high, nth uh, degree at that moment. And only when we came back, we gradually did it. We didn't do PFTs for a uh, period of time. I think that we all were experienced similar um, experiences as you had uh, reported on your survey, which was uh, very nice. Okay, so you also had a question. What are some of the barriers of, uh, to conducting research during COVID, which yeah. you touched upon some of them? Yeah, right. And, I, and I, you know, I think the big ones, uh, fortunately, we can get face-to-face -face visits with telehealth, but the biggest barrier is data collection, uh, trying to get the uh, safety labs and testing the primary endpoints and secondary endpoints for the study with pulmonary function testing, CT scans, questionnaires, those ancillary studies that are key. So I think as we develop uh, objective data uh, testing for telehealth, just in general care, that's going to bleed over to uh, research sort of backup situations uh, too, because I think that's a big hole that we need to put in the future because um, this will probably not be the first or last uh, infectious uh, series or epidemic or pandemic that we experience uh, with patients. Lisa, how does the uh, 
the desire or lack of desire of a patient to come in to a, a, a situation like this impact the results that you saw. So patients were fearful of coming in, even when we opened up with all the um, uh, with all the precautions that we had. And so that certainly needed to be taken into account when we have our results of the surveys and, and things. So. Right, and uh, we did not uh, poll patients. So I don't have a, a fear assessment for that in particular, but I can tell you what ended up uh, helping us, at least at our center, we, uh, when the medical center started uh, ramping up and uh, for inpatient care and uh, decreasing outpatient care uh, for patients, we decided to uh, move our research uh, practices with our ILD patients to its clinic area that had been closed previously. So our patients drove in to, there was an underground parking deck and they could park right next to the elevator, uh, elevator up uh, to the third floor. And when they got off, they were met by the uh, coordinator, clinical coordinator, uh, who did their vital signs and, and COVID questions. And then they went into a clinic right across the hallway. And uh, the only people that they saw were the uh, coordinator and then their physician. And then we put them back in the elevator and back in their car and went home and asked them not stop and get gas or virtual so that we could just make sure that visit wasn't putting them at undue risk. So that was a strategy that we were lucky enough to find a location like that on our campus uh, to be able to utilize. Um, and one we've actually kept on as an address uh, on our uh, locations for research to be able to mobilize to, uh, if uh, surges made it necessary uh, after that initial, initial surge. Mm -hmm. So that was at least one strategy that worked for us. Every center is different uh, in how they do that, uh, what works best and what they're able to do. But I think isolation and feeling confident in that isolation from uh, sick patients coming into a clinic or hospital setting was helpful uh, to our patients uh, and what we heard from them. Okay. There are some questions that have been already addressed. Uh, let me try to um, see. And I wish that. Uh, oh, here's a question about the information on the adenovirus uh, vaccine. So you provided the percent of subjects with antibody response after two mRNA uh, vaccine doses by immunocompromised, uh, with immunocompromised condition. Do you have that information for the adenovirus? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. And I just recently looked and unless I'm missing something that Lisa or Rob know about, I have not seen that studied well in immunocompromised patients. Um, the, the, all, all the literature and the studies have been done in um, MR, two dose mRNA recipients, and then with a with a third um, third dose added, and that's where we that's where those recommendations have come from. Okay, wonderful. There are a number of other questions that, if you see them in the chat and you want to address them, that will be great. Uh, I have a question I wanted to ask Lisa. Um, do you feel like um, as research sites will be, um, will be needing to move back to these more restrictive practices because of safety in the future or because potentially of staffing and, and allocation of resources? I ask because I feel like at this point, a healthcare facility is maybe one of the safest places to be since uh, the staff are required to be vaccinated. There's universal masking everywhere. Um, and we are trying to continue to space and um, utilize those precautionary practices more than any place else that you can go in public. Right, right. Uh, definitely much safer than the grocery store or the drugstore, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, totally agree. I think 
Uh, staffing, I think you hit on a really key point. Staffing uh, is a big issue. And when, when uh, the hospital gets ramped up, they tend to pull staff from other locations, which uh, lessens their ability to take care of people in the clinic. And I, I think that's something we all uh, need to be cognizant of not just as providers, but also, you know, as patients, when you, when you call in and maybe that, that thing that took, you know, one day to solve pre-pandemic might be taking, you know, three days or longer to take care of recognizing that during these surges, they're just not the same number of people on the other end of the phone. Um, one of the questions uh, asked about medical assistance, and I think, unfortunately, that's one thing I, I didn't think about with the uh, uh, with the questions and the surveys, but th those are key personnel that are scheduling, that are frontline answering questions and uh, coordinating patient care. So it's, uh, and many of them were having to work from home, uh, not be able to come in, not without the uh, usual computer resources that they may have had before. So I, I think that uh, all the all the cogs in the wheel essentially got uh, slowed down in the process. Okay, uh, Rob, there was a very interesting question that came in uh, about biopsy, ILD uh, in post COVID. So, have you ever sent a post COVID patient for lung biopsy? who had had fleeting or recurrent infiltrates to prove or disprove organizing pneumonia? If so, do you believe that this is an entity of post-COVID ILD? Well, that's a great question. And um, one that we, we often discuss in our clinical conferences. We, we have sent some patients for um, transbronchial biopsies um, to determine whether or not they had organizing pneumonia when we weren't sure from the um, from the HRCT, um, but for the most part, um, patients have been managed without biopsies, um, and certainly um, we haven't done surgical lung biopsies in this population yet. So I think it's a great question, and um, uh, I think as our radiologists get more confident in interpreting the CTs, um, there'll be less need for it, but um, there may be cases where biopsies are really helpful. Yes. I, uh, to be determined. I, uh, thank you. And have you seen an acute exacerbation in a post-COVID ILD patient? Um, I think that we have, but it's a hard thing to prove one way or another. Yeah. Okay. Very good. We have... Um, any pressing questions that need to be answered as we are running out of time? I don't. <laughs> okay, so we can uh, answer these uh, probably personally or uh, directly to the uh, persons. But right now, uh, we will just uh, want to remind. Thank you again for your participation in this uh, session. I have learned a tremendous amount, and I hope you have also. So we will um, want to encourage you to join our, uh, uh, in the presentation of the second day of our clinical uh, trial innovation series in theater two in, uh, in an hour. So please join us there to hear updates from the United Therapeutics Corporation, Pliant Therapeutics Inc. and Chiesi Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we thank you again uh, for your participation and uh, again, have a wonderful day.